WGLC presents Brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners Shalom, I'm Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries and we welcome you today to our study on the Hebraic Roots of Christianity We need to remember that when we're studying the Hebraic Roots of Christianity we must keep everything centered on Yeshua the Messiah. That is because in Psalm chapter 40 verse 7 it is written, Then said I, Lo I come, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. That verse is quoted in Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 7 referring to Yeshua the Messiah. Yeshua himself said in Luke chapter 24 verse 44, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Yeshua said that the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms are written of him. In order for us to fully understand our Bible, we need to understand how that is so. We need to see Yeshua in the Hebrew scriptures. We need to see Yeshua in the Torah and relate that to his first coming and by doing so we'll be able to relate it to his second coming. We need to see Yeshua from Genesis to Revelation. We have explicit verses in the New Testament that allows us to understand and see Yeshua in the Torah. For example, John chapter 1 verse 3, Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. We're told that Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Paul explained in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 and in that verse he's quoting and referring to Genesis chapter 17 verse 7 that it was Yeshua who made covenant with Abraham. It says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 that if you are Messiah, if you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah then are you Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. Paul explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1-4, through 4, that in the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, that the rock that was with them, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, is Yeshua the Messiah. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 35 tells us that the rock that was with the children of Israel in the wilderness, that the rock is also the Redeemer. And the rock in the Redeemer is who they grieved in the desert. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 40. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27, Yeshua said, He is the rock that if you build your life upon Him, that when the storms of life come, that you will be able to withhold the storms of life. And so the rock, who is the Redeemer, is also the one who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, who defeated Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 6, the one who defeated Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea is the right hand. The right hand is a term for the Messiah, as we're told in Hebrews in chapter 1, that Yeshua is the right hand of his Father. Now, the right hand in Hebrew represents power, strength, deliverance. It represents salvation. Yeshua is the strength, the salvation, the deliverance of the nation of Israel. And so, it is Yeshua who redeemed his people out of Egypt. And the one who is the Savior is also the lawgiver. We're told in James chapter 4, verse 12, there's one lawgiver that is able to save. The one that saves is Yeshua. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, you will call his name Yeshua because he will save his people from their sins. Now, the lawgiver is also the bridegroom. And there was a marriage that was made at Mount Sinai between the lawgiver and the bridegroom and his bride. His bride is the house of Jacob. The bride is the 
nation of Israel. We're told about this marriage in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 8 through 13. But after the bride of Messiah, the house of Jacob, the nation of Israel, said in Exodus chapter 19, verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. She worshipped the golden calf. And in succeeding generations, she went after other gods. She went after Baal. Baal in Hebrew is husband. Baalim, other gods. The gods of the nations of the world. And as a result, the land that he gave as an inheritance to his bride, the land of Israel, who he brought the children of Israel unto when he brought them out of Egypt, that in their unfaithfulness to him in the land, as is detailed in the book of Judges where they went after other gods, as a result, they were exiled into the nations of the world. He kicked her out of his house. That is the land of Israel. It was the Assyrians who originally took the northern kingdom captivity. It was the Babylonians who took the southern kingdom captivity. We're told in Jeremiah in chapter 31 and verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, that is to the ends of the earth, and say, he that scattered Israel. Well, who is the one that scattered Israel? It's the lawgiver and the bridegroom that the one that scattered will gather and who's the one that gathers it is the good shepherd he will gather him and keep him guard him as a shepherd does his flock it is the good shepherd that's going to gather the sheep from exile Yeshua explained in John chapter 10 verse 11 and verse 14 that he is the good shepherd. He was explaining this here in John chapter 10 to the Pharisees who are Jews, who is the house of Judah, who is the southern kingdom. And he's explaining to the Pharisees or the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, not only that he's the good shepherd, but that he has another sheepfold, John chapter 10 verse 16, that is not of that fold, that fold meaning the house of Judah. And that this other sheepfold he must bring. In that other sheepfold they will hear his voice. Meaning they will believe that he's the Messiah. And they will in hearing his voice follow his Torah. And ultimately there will be one fold. That is the uniting of the two sheepfolds. That is the uniting of the twelve tribes of Israel. Wherein Yeshua said there will be one shepherd over them. That would be him. He is the good shepherd. So Yeshua said the 12 tribes are going to be united and he's going to be the good shepherd ruling and reigning over them. When's this going to happen? In the Messianic era. That the uniting of the 12 tribes happens during the tribulation. And the celebration of the uniting of the 12 tribes comes when Messiah sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. And then Israel is the head of all nations and the Torah will be taught by the 12 tribes united to the nations of the world during the Messianic era from Jerusalem. Out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, as we're told in Isaiah in chapter 2 and verse 3. But Messiah at his first coming explains to the Pharisees or the house of Judah in John chapter 10 verse 17, Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life. Why did he lay down his life? It was to redeem his bride who was unfaithful to him that went after other gods that in his deep love for his bride even though she was unfaithful to him he still wants to show his love to her he does so by laying down his life in shedding his blood it is prophesied in Zechariah in chapter 9 in verse 11 that by the blood of the covenant I have sent forth the prisoners out of the pit. Who are the prisoners in the pit? In Zechariah 9.13, it's Judah and Ephraim. What is the prison in the pit? It's the nations of the world where the 12 tribes were taken to. And there, the nations of the world ruled over them with cruelty. But their deliverance is repenting of their sins. Their deliverance is by the blood of the covenant. Their deliverance 
is by returning to their bridegroom, believing that their Redeemer is Yeshua the Messiah, and through their repentance in the shedding of His blood, He will forgive her of her sin. He will renew the relationship. That is the renewed covenant. The renewed covenant was only made with the house of Israel in the house of Judah, Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8. That in renewing the covenant, he would write the Torah upon her heart. He would give her his indwelling Holy Spirit so that she could then please him because the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, John chapter 16, verse 13, would lead her and guide her in all truth. And um, the Holy Spirit would then teach her how to follow his Torah. And so Yeshua died for the purpose of gathering, uniting the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he, at his first coming, he trained up disciples. And he said to his disciples, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And he stated this um, in uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 17. That the phrase fishers of men has a deeper meaning. That in the blessing that was given to Ephraim and Manasseh in uh, Genesis in chapter 48, it says in the King James uh, that... They will grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. But the word grow is the Hebrew word, the God, which means fish. They will increase as fish. Multiply is what the literal Hebrew says. But it says in the earth. But fish don't multiply in the earth. They multiply in the sea. That's why it wasn't translated literally. But Ephraim and Manasseh are likened into fish who are going to be blessed and multiply in the earth. But... All 12 tribes, that means that includes the northern kingdom. When they broke the covenant, they got exiled in the nations of the world. And forgiveness is going to be offered to them. Yeshua is going to send out his disciples to proclaim the good news that he's the Messiah. That they repent of their sins. That they return to the Torah. And that he's coming to deliver them from their exile. To gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. So when he makes them fishers of men, the word... Men, or man in Hebrew, is Adam. Adam is a term that refers to all mankind, but in Ezekiel, in chapter 34, in verse 31, there we're told that the nation of Israel, that they are men, or they are Adam. So when he's making his disciples fishers of men, it's of all mankind, and he's making them fishers of the exiles of Israel. The redemption, the new covenant, is only unto the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But anyone from the nations, all mankind, who wants to repent of their sins, that they can receive Yeshua as the Messiah, and then they enter into the new covenant. And in doing so, they're grafted in, Romans 11, verse 17. And they're grafted into the olive tree. The olive tree is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Jeremiah 11, verses 16 and 17. They become a part of the commonwealth of Israel. So those who uh, come to Messiah and want to live for him, they live according to the Torah, but they become his servants. And being his servants, he has a task for them, that they are going to be fishers of men. They're going to be a light to the world. They're going to live their life under the Messiah. They're going to follow his Torah. They're going to proclaim to the world that Yeshua is the Messiah and that he came to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. And so in Acts chapter 1, we have in verse 6 that a question is asked of Yeshua. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The restoration of the kingdom of Israel is the uniting of all 12 tribes. And he says how it's going to happen. It says in verse 8, You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses of what? The witness of the restoration of the kingdom. And you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So in Acts chapter 2, we have an account 
when we have that empowering in Jerusalem, then in Acts chapter 8, we said, we see as a result of persecution, it goes to Judea, Samaria. And in Acts chapter 9, we have the account of the salvation of Paul. And he has a calling on his life to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles. But who are the Gentiles that Paul is proclaiming the good news to? Primarily the northern kingdom. And in proclaiming the good news to the northern kingdom, it will go to the ends of the earth. It will go to all mankind. So Paul himself testified when he was before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verses 6 and 7. He says, And now I stand am and judge for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So Paul uses the word hope in Acts 26 verse 6, and he uses it twice in verse 7. That Paul was being accused here that he did not follow the Torah, and that he was teaching Jews to believe in Yeshua, but to not follow the Torah. And so Paul here is testifying that this is false. And so in the dispute, he ultimately comes before King Agrippa. And he said, that's why I'm being judged. I'm being judged for the hope that God made to the, pro to the fathers. What hope? That he would deliver his people, his bride, the exiles of Israel, he would redeem them and deliver them from their enemy, from the nations where they've been scattered. And it's a promise that he made to our 12 tribes. And it's a promise that they hope to come. It's future, which means it hasn't happened yet. He hasn't united the 12 tribes of Israel. It is a promise which he hopes to come. Well, when Paul received Yeshua as Messiah, he immediately proclaimed Yeshua in the synagogues, as we're told in Acts, in uh, chapter 9, in verse 20. And straightway he preached Messiah in the synagogues. Well, primarily in the synagogues were the Jews, but there were non-Jews with the Jews in the synagogue, especially outside of the land of Israel. And so in Acts chapter 13, we have where Paul is out proclaiming in the synagogues, Yeshua being the Messiah. And it says in Acts 13, 44, and the next Sabbath day came the whole city together to hear the word of God. But the Jews um, in the diaspora outside of the land of Israel, they were um, disputing with Paul. They were contradicting what he was saying, contradicting that Yeshua is the Messiah. And that Yeshua died to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel. So Paul became frustrated. And then in Acts 13 verse 46, it says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, um, and I will read uh, the whole verse uh, uh, to you here. It's necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing that you put it from you, um, it says, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Verse 47, for so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I've set you to be a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. What Paul is quoting, where he sees his biblical mandate to go to the Gentiles, is Isaiah chapter 49. So we need to go to Isaiah chapter 49 and see what and how Paul saw himself in his calling and his mission. In Isaiah, in chapter uh, 49 and verse 6, it says, It's a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Now, raising up the tribes of Jacob is the gathering and uniting of the twelve tribes of Israel. But I will give you to be a light to the Gentiles that you may be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 9 that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. Now the prisoners who are in the pit in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 11 is Judah and Ephraim. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 13. But Paul said we turn to the Gentiles. Well, Judah um, uh, is Judah. They're Jewish. Um, the Gentiles would be 
a reference to the assimilated northern kingdom that they had intermarried with the nations of the world and they became Gentiles. They became like the people and practiced the customs of the people that they intermarried with. So the Gentiles would be, would be a reference to the assimilated northern kingdom, but as well the literal non-Jews who were not of the northern kingdom. It would speak to both of them. So it says in Isaiah 49.9, of which Paul is making a reference to in Acts chapter 13, verses 46 and 47, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. Now, who are these prisoners? In the book, A Matter of Return, by Raphael Eisenberg, on page 132, um, quoting from the Midrash Rabbat to Isaiah in chapter 49.9, it says the Midrash Rabbah explains that the prisoners denotes the tribes residing beyond the Sabbatian, meaning the northern kingdom. The rabbis see that the prisoners of Isaiah 49.9 is the northern kingdom. This is repeated in the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 7, page 172 saying to the prisoners, go forth, Isaiah 49.9. This alludes to those that were exiled to this side of the river Sabbatian, that is, the ten tribes who the Assyrians took captive. Well, if the rabbis saw that Isaiah 49 is a reference to the northern kingdom, then Paul, who was tied at the feet of Gamaliel, obviously he would have understood when he quoted in Acts 13, 46 and 47, quoting Isaiah 49, he knew that the calling was to go out uh, to the exiles, to the northern kingdom, and in doing so, the proclamation would be to the ends of the earth, to all of the earth. Now, in Ezekiel in chapter 37, uh, there's a prophecy of the valley of the vision of dry bones. So it says in Ezekiel 37, 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me. He carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Verse 2, and he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, they were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were, they were very dry. Verse 3, he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O Lord God, you know. And he said unto me, prophesy to these bones and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 5, thus is the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter unto you and you shall live. Now verse 11 is the key verse. Who are these dry bones? He said, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. That is all 12 tribes. Behold, they say our bones are dried, our hope is is lost because we're cut off from our parts. The bones are the whole house of Israel. And until they are united, their hope is lost. So not being united is a hope being lost because in not being united, they are cut off from their parts. So it goes on to say in Ezekiel 37 verses 15 through 28 that the 12 tribes are going to be united. Ephraim and Judah are going to be made one in the Father's hands, in the redemptive work of the Messiah, Yahweh, Yeshua. But in being separated, it says, our hope is lost. That's the key phrase which I want you to see. Now, in Acts chapter 26, verses 6 and 7, Paul uses that word hope before King Agrippa. I'm judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. A promise that was made to the twelve tribes in verse 7. For which hope say King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So there were the Jews who were contradicting that Paul was proclaiming that Yeshua is the Messiah. And that he's going to bring the non-Jew into covenant relationship. So in referring to the persecution that he's receiving of the Jews, of which he testified before King Agrippa, he goes to Rome 
in Acts chapter 28, in verse 17, it says, He came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I've committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He's referring back to the events in Acts chapter 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, and ultimately before King Agrippa. And it says, and for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you, to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And so Paul says he was bound with the chain for the hope of Israel. Paul is a prisoner of hope. For which hope, say King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So we can see here that Paul was being persecuted for proclaiming that Yeshua is the Messiah, that he's going to gather and unite the 12 tribes of Israel, and that he is going to bring the northern kingdom and restore them. And in doing so, he's going to offer salvation to the whole world, to the nations of the world. And so, this... I, believe, I pray as a blessing to you. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.